Okay, hello. So this will be a video uh, of me uh, explaining the solutions behind uh, the Chapter 7 problems in uh, Quantum Field Theory for the Gifted Amateur by uh, wait, sorry, by Tom Lancaster and Stephen J. Blundell. Okay. Uh, so here I've written out the Euler Lagrange equations for a four-dimensional space-time field just so we can use that for reference because it's going to be really handy in these exercises. Okay, so the first exercise in chapter 7, 7.1 asks us for the Lagrangian L given by 1 half d mu phi d mu phi minus 1 half m squared phi squared minus summation n equals 1 to infinity of uh, lambda n times phi of 2n plus 2 phi to the 2n plus 2 show that the equations of motion are given by this d squared, d squared plus m squared phi plus uh, summation from n equals 1 to infinity lambda n 2n plus 2 phi of 2n plus 1 equals 0. Okay? So we know that to find the equations of motion for a given system, all we have to do is plug in this Lagrangian into the Euler Lagrange equations, which I've written out here, as I've said. Okay, so let's calculate the first term. Oh, wait, oops. Which is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the field phi. So Let's look at the terms one by one. So here, there's no phi dependence in the first term because these are these. This is d phi. This is d mu phi, d mu phi. There is no phi which which has not been taken, which does is not attached to a derivative. Therefore, there's no dependence on the phi, and this term goes to zero when we take the derivative of it. But on the second term, there is phi here without a derivative attached. So we have to consider this term. And in the last term in the summation, there's also a phi without the derivative attached. So we also have to confirm. Uh, we also have to consider that term. Okay. So let's first take the derivative of the second term. So that will be negative. Obviously, power rule. Just bring the two down. Blah, blah. Uh, you get m squared phi. Okay. Then the next one, the last term, the summation term, might look a little bit intimidating because we might not. You might think we have to actually expand the summation, which is probably impossible since there's it goes all the way up to infinity. We just have to remember that when we're taking the derivative of a summation, we can just bring the derivative inside the summation, right? So bringing our derivative with respect to phi into the summation, uh, this is a constant with respect to phi, but this is phi, the variable itself. So we just use a power rule again, and uh, let me write it out here, and it goes 1 to infinity, psi n. So we bring down this 2n plus 2, and we minus 1 from that exponent, so we get 2n plus 1. Now we, we get the second term in the Euler Lagrange equations, which is um, d mu, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the derivative of phi. Okay, so first let's get the derivative Lagrangian with respect to the derivative of the phi field. Now we already identified a while ago that this first term has dependence on the derivative of the phi field, right? So this is the only one we'll consider for our scenario. So this is actually, because this is just d mu phi times d mu phi, this is actually just d mu phi squared, and we can uh, apply the product rule again. So we'll get d mu phi. And all these other terms don't have any uh they don't have any dependence on d mu phi so they go to zero okay next we need to take the we need to take the derivative of the thing we just got so we just do that take the derivative of both sides and then we get the second term of the Euler Lagrange equations easy okay we should probably write this out like that Okay. Oh my god. Okay, good enough. Whatever. Uh, 
So what other what the other Grange equation says is that when you get this first equation that we derived a while ago, and we subtract from it the second equation, we get the equations of motion, right? So what we should do is we should first take this first equation. Just writing it out here. And we subtract from it this second equation. Where I wrote this double derivative as just d squared. Okay, so d squared phi. And then that should be equal to zero by the Euler Lagrange equations. But we notice that there's a phi here, there's a phi here we can uh, factor this out. So we bring this negative, so we'll just basically bring this term over here and we're gonna factor out uh, we're gonna factor out a phi from them. that should be equal to zero. But you realize this is, it looks like what we're supposed to prove, but it's, which is this. But it's not exactly because we have negative signs here. That's because we've been working in the left-hand side. We can just move all of this to the right-hand side, and these will all become pluses. And we have thus proved that this these are the equations of motion for this Lagrangian here. Okay, the next problem, 7.2, uh, says consider a massive scalar field phi of x coupled to a source j of x. Okay, described by the Lagrangian of equation 7.10, which was somewhere in the chapter, which is this. Okay. So we already see we will see in a sec here okay so this Lagrangian is actually coupled to a source term oh. source term j of x okay so that's the Lagrangian that the question is asking us to consider and it's asking us to show that the equations of motion are those of equation 7.11 which is also in the chapter which is given by this So you see the source term becomes apparent here. Okay, so we just want to prove this. Um, again, we're just going to plug it into the Euler-Lagrange equation. So first term, dl d phi. Okay, what do we see here? Well, that's a derivative of phi, so we're not going to consider that. That goes to zero when we take the derivative with respect to phi. Uh, but here, there's some. There's a phi here, so I'm going to consider this. There's also phi here, so we're going to consider this. Okay, cheating phi like a, a variable. We can use the product, uh, the power rule again here, and we're just going to get negative m squared phi, right? And then for this source term, uh, when we use the power rule here, uh, this is phi to the power of one. So obviously it's just going to become phi to the power of zero. It becomes one. We're left with j of x. Okay. The next term we have to calculate is this. Okay. So there's only uh, one dependence on the der derivative of phi here, and it's this first term. So, like the previous example, you know, it's already going to be db phi. Okay, pretty easy. And then we just need to take the derivative. We just need to take the derivative now of that, which is just the derivative of d mu phi. Okay. Okay. Now, we want to prove that 
this the ground and gives us this so uh, we're just gonna plug these these into the Euler Lagrange equations again so dl d phi which is this for us negative m squared phi plus j of x minus this right minus d squared phi and by the Euler Lagrange equations it should be equal to zero okay now we want to prove that the equations of motion are these, right? So we gotta do some algebra here, right? We can bring this term and this term over to the right side. So we get j of x equals to d squared phi plus m squared phi, and then that's equal to d squared plus m squared all times phi. We get j of x here, and there, we're done. We've proved that the equations of motion are these for this Lagrangian. Right, or we can just swap them out. Anyway. Okay, now seven point three, problem seven point three, is that show that says show that the equations of motion following from the Lagrangian in equation seven point fourteen, uh, seven point fourteen, which is this. This might be quite a while to write out. Okay, one more term. Okay, so the question is asking to show that the Lagrange, the equations of, mo equations of motion following from this Lagrangian uh, are the coupled equations and show some equations. I'm just going to write d mu d mu as d squared to save time. Okay, and then the analogous version for the second phi field. Okay. Okay, right, so we're going to follow our prescription again closely. So first term in the Euler-Lagrange equations we want to get is this, dl d phi. So looking at this Lagrangian over here, we see that this term goes to zero. There's no dependence on phi there. On phi 1, my bad. Uh, so instead of uh, using the Euler-Lagrange equations for a singular phi field, we'll split the Euler-Lagrange equations into two equations, basically. one for each uh, phi field, so there will be one for the phi field one, phi 1, and there will be another one for the phi field phi 2. For the field phi 2, I don't know why I'm saying phi field, it's kind of redundant. Okay, so phi 1, okay, let's take the derivative of this with respect to phi 1. There's one over here, so this term, we have to consider that one. This is phi 2, it's useless. This is a derivative of phi 1 that's useless. This is phi 2 that's useless and here. There's something here, so we also have to consider that. So phi 1 squared. Okay, so this one's pretty easy. We already did that one. That's negative m squared phi for that term. Phi 1. Taking the derivative. Uh, here's uh, a little bit... You could maybe mistake... You could, you could maybe make a mistake here. So, it's quite important. Uh, because there's a square here, so we have to apply some more derivative rules that we know. Okay, um, my bad. 
So it will be a minus, right? Minus g. Since g does not depend on phi one, we can just take it out of the derivative. And then uh, let's try expanding this. Let's try expanding this uh, this uh, term in the brackets here. So that will be phi one to the power of four plus uh, plus two phi one squared phi two squared plus phi two to the power of four. Okay. Okay. So this is our uh, all times g. This is basically this. Okay. Taking the derivative, let's take the derivative of this now with respect to phi one and put it here. So over here, that becomes this first term has phi one. So let's use the power rule. The second term uh, also has phi one. So we're going to use the power rule again. And this last term has no phi one, so okay. That's our dl d phi one. Next, we have to take dl d d u phi one. Okay, so Lagrangian is given by this, right? Uh, so there's a there's the dependence on the derivative of phi one over here, this term. So we're gonna consider that uh, none over here, none over here, because that's the derivative of phi two. None over here, none over here. So this is quite easy. This just becomes we've already done this. It just becomes d mu phi. Then obviously we take the derivative to get the Euler-Lagrange term again. So we get that. Okay. Now we have to uh, we have to take this term and subtract from it this. So writing that out, negative. We'll make it a little bit more over here. And we subtract from it our uh, second derivative of phi, and we set that equal to zero by the Euler-Lagrange equations. Okay, so we're asked to prove this. Now, again, we have some pesky minus signs, so we just multiply both sides of the equation by negative one. We get this, and that proves step one. Now all you have to do for to, to prove the other equation, you just have to replace this with phi two, and then you have to replace this with phi two also, and you'll get um, the analogous version for second equation. I'm not gonna do it though because if you look at the Lagrangian, all terms have all terms for phi one have a matching term for phi two, right? So this one has this term matching it. This term has this term matching it, and this term obviously it's uh, it's the same no matter if even if I switch phi one and phi two. So undergoing the same process, I should get this again for phi two instead of phi one this time. Okay, so that was easy.